off of my teaching for one Sunday. I say one Sunday, that's my plan. And I'm going to probably finish up next Sunday with that spiritual warfare area, but I will need to finish that message in Acts chapter 12. But boy, yesterday I spent some good quality time in the office with the Lord, and, and uh, He just began to teach me and talk to me and share with me about some things. And uh, He wants me to just share that with you today. Amen. And so, but I got a little video this morning uh, that I want to show. It's five, six minutes, and uh, many of you have saw the video of uh, Susan Boyle, and it's a very powerful, very powerful video where God will show us that you don't have to be some big name preacher, you don't have to be, you know, somebody that uh, everybody knows. Uh, you don't have to be like Catherine Kuhlman said, a, wi- uh, a silver vessel or a gold vessel. All you need to be is a willing vessel. Amen. And God has made every one of us different, which is a beautiful thing, but he's put something in every, every one of us, inside of us, right? And I want to show you this little video, and then I'm going to preach off from it this morning, something the Lord talked to me about. And I'm going to be honest with you. When he gave me this, and I'm laying over my desk crying yesterday morning, I said, Lord, I can't believe you're doing me like this. I can't believe that you want me to show this in church. But then the Holy Ghost just kept on, kept on pouring that honey out. And I said, oh yeah, that's where we need to be, amen. God's good, ain't he, church? Amen. This lady was asked some questions. What is your name? Where are you from? How old are you? What's your dream? What's the dream that God put inside of you? I could stop right there and say that you're never too old. It don't matter who you are, where you come from. Whatever God started, He aims to finish. He just needs us positioned. Listen to this. The question was asked, why hasn't it worked out before? And here's what she said. I've never been given a chance. But here, I'm hoping that will change. That's what this sanctuary and this word and this truth is about today. They laughed at her. They mocked her. They ridiculed her. But what was in her came out. And all three judges voted yes. All three of them voted yes. And you know, when I looked at this and the Lord began to talk to my heart yesterday morning, and I mean, I'm in the middle of my other sermon when I see this, and well, I was directed to it. We all can identify with Susan Boyle in some way. All of us, a lot of odds are against us. Sometimes we feel like we're the underdogs. We're inadequate. We're not qualified. You know, we don't fit the bill, if you will. And because of, you know, appearance or the appearance of the fruit of my life that, you know, I'm disqualified. And there's probably a lot of times she wanted a chance but I want you to know this day came and I believe it's going to come for people in this house I believe the Lord made every one of us uniquely and I believe God's put something in every one of us and I I don't believe that you're ever going to be a happy person and listen let me tell you something I'm born again. I'm filled with the Spirit of God. I'm baptized in Jesus' name. I've done it all that I read in this Bible that I'm supposed to be qualified to do. But there's still a hole in my heart till I do what God has called me to do. Till I walk in that that purpose that He set for my life. And I want to preach to you this morning to us on the three yeses of God. You know, I thought about this story. I remember years ago, there was a 
young man in our community, a little bit older than me, my family will know him and several of you, Bobby Ray Myrick. And, you know, we, we was raised around Bobby Ray, and he was uh, the mechanic in Central. Bobby Ray became a missionary Baptist pastor. When I run into him, I didn't even know he was called to preach. Bobby Ray was in a, a little small, which is what most are, not a critical statement, but most little, you know, pioneered missionary Baptist churches, and he was there pastoring. And he was asked to go preach in a church up in... Uh, the Dixie area below Hattiesburg in that area. And this is before iPhones and Google and all of the you know, MapQuest and all of our help today. When Bobby Ray drove up to the church, it was a 2,500-seater church. And Bobby Ray was so preconceived I'm at the wrong place because back then it was take Highway 98, take a left at this exit, go two miles, take a dirt road, you know, mockingbird sitting on a limb, you know, stuff of that nature where we gave directions. Bobby Ray was so, couldn't believe it that he turned around, drove down to the store, that's what we used to do, and asked the clerk... Where is the church where so-and-so pastors? They said, right turn on that hill, that big church. Bobby Ray could not believe that God had opened him up such a door. And I want to tell you, we need to quit limiting God. Because if, the, if God of the universe was good enough to put us here and put something inside of us, then what he put inside of us is bigger than him, bigger than us. It's bigger than us, okay? So we need to quit putting limits on God. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel 16. I want to read three places today. And I feel like today that God is going to put value on his children. We are sons and daughters. We are not church members. Anybody can go somewhere and join a church with certain credentials. We are sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. First thing we need to do is clear up our identity of who I am and whose I am. I belong to him and he loves me with a love that I can't even fathom. Amen. And that goes for all of us today. 1 Samuel 16, the Lord, verse 1 said unto Samuel, How long without mourn for Saul? See, and I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided, that's past tense, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with thee. And say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to, the, to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he, Samuel, looked on Eliab, and said, Surely, surely, the Lord's anointed is before him. Now let me stop and say something right there. Samuel is the first prophet in the Bible. He, in that day, the prophets were called seers, which means God shows us things you don't see. And here, the seer, the first prophet, he judged a man by his stature. He judged a man by his height and, you know, one that looked like he ought to be a king. We're talking Samuel. We're not talking, you know, we're just trying to figure out, discern what the Lord said. We're talking the man of God, the seer, missed God. Okay, I want that to be real clear because there's people in your life 
that have looked at you and they've missed it. And we need to understand that God has purpose. He has plan. He has a a package inside of each one of us for his kingdom. And the Lord don't want you to spend your life trying to find out his will. He wants you to get to know him. That's the way you find out his will. You get to know him. And from that relationship, he unveils his plan for you. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. When this woman walked out on this stage, everybody, even the judges, looked at her outward appearance. Now let's be just uh, carefully real here for a moment. She didn't look like a model. She didn't look like a singer in Hollywood. She didn't look like that she fit the bill. She didn't look like she belonged on that stage. Looking at the outward, you would think if what's on the inside is matches the outside, we're all in trouble. But nobody knew what God had put inside of this woman. Nobody knew it. Only God can do that. Only God can do that and then we choose if we're going to use it for his glory or not. God gives us favor, skills, blessings, talents, gifts, callings, mantles, anointings. And when this woman come out there on that stage, everybody was rolling their eyes. (laughs) Everybody was shaking their head. Everybody was thinking, what is this, a prank, a joke? Look at this woman. She's overweight. She's not very beautiful. But I want you to know the beauty was on the inside. The download of God was the beauty. And I want you to know that's in every one of us today. See, the enemy wants us to, wants us to think we're ugly. The enemy wants us to think because of our failures and our sins and our shortcomings and we don't fit the bill and measure up and outwardly we don't, uh, you know, we, we're not that, uh, that uh, a plaque of honor, if you will. But I want you to know that God, amen, God has made beauty and put it on the inside of us and there is a time and a platform and there is a place where God wants to display his handiwork. Then Jesse called Abinadab, passed him before Samuel, and then he called Shammah. In other words, what Jesse done was he picked out the three that he thought would be candidates. He thought if anybody's going to be king, I've done got it. I done got them picked out. I done got it figured out. And so he passed the three before him and when they were refused, then he had to go to the others and get them and pass them all back before Samuel. And what happened here was when Samuel, after he had done got checked by the Lord, you don't just go looking on the outward. In church, we do that too many times. We need to love without dissimulation. That means we need to love everybody the same without a hook in it. You know what that means? That means I'm not getting something out of this. I'm just going to love you the way he loves me because I understand how unlovable I am and how much he loves me and I've experienced that and now I understand how to express that. Here these boys walked in front of Samuel again, the prophet, the man with the eyes of God, the seer. And then after a check, He looked at Jesse, and I'm going to just say it in my words. He said, you know, I just can't get a peace or a release from God. Is is this all of your children? 
And he said, well, now we got one more, the youngest. He keeps sheep, we audition. We don't even look at him as a candidate. We don't, I didn't even invite him. I didn't invite him because I didn't think nobody would ever anoint him. I didn't think he'd ever be crowned a king in Israel. Look at him. He's not kingly material. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And God had already said, I've already provided me a king. God had already provided a king and his name was David, watch this. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, I just wanna touch it and move along. Verse 11, there remaineth yet the youngest, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said, send and fetch him for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him and he was redheaded. That's what that means. And with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And watch this. Picture Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, the big older brothers. And here comes David walking up the runt of the family, right? Just imagine Eliab when David walked back, he just, like these people, just, king. Just imagine the little old, you understand the ridicules, the little remarks, right? We would say in George County, the pop-offs, <laughs> right? The smart aleck remarks. And here comes David just walking up. He ain't asked for this. Let me tell you what God's done in you, you don't have to ask for it. You just have to show up. And there'll be a time when the Lord will bring it out. And here when David come walking up, everybody's standing there and everybody's thinking, you know, maybe he missed the, maybe he's got the wrong family. Maybe he needs to get somebody else instead of Jesse's family because he's done went through all the qualified candidates. But all of a sudden, when David come walking up, Samuel said, Arise, the Lord told Samuel, arise and anoint him for this is he. This is the one God picked. This is the one God picked. One more verse. And Samuel took the horn of all and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day and forward. Yes, over David. Pow. Right? Yes, over David. Then I want to move you right here. I'm moving quick this morning. Over to Matthew chapter 3. And I want to read you two scriptures right here. Yes, over David. Chapter 3, verse 16. Jesus is in the Jordan River and there he is being baptized and the Bible said that he went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him the oil went on David over in the Old Testament. And now the oil is coming on Jesus in a different form. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Let me talk to us just a minute. I want to slow down and talk to us about this. Here we find a yes on Jesus. And somebody would maybe, somebody would maybe think, somebody, we got rains, baby, back there turning the lights on. <laughs> and that's practically fine, sister. We glad y'all here. Somebody would think, 
I mean, this is a no-brainer that God would say yes over Jesus. But what I want to bring out for just a couple minutes is this, that this yes was not based on performance. This yes was based on sonship. You see, performance only offers two categories, success or failure. See, success is when we do good, we are accepted, and we have a stamp of approval on us. But failure is when we don't do good or so good, and we're rejected, and there's a stamp of disapproval on us. We know this story, and we've heard this, but we need to rehearse it until we're not, it's not just taught, it's caught, okay? That Jesus had never done anything yet. He had never preached a sermon. He had never raised the dead. He had never done any miracles. He had never done anything except come out of the water like these people done. <laughs> and at that moment, God said, God said, you're my beloved son and I am well pleased. And I'm going to tell you, if we could, we could ever get a hold of this right here, as sons and daughters of the Lord, we'd walk different. We'd walk different. Amen? See, the worldview is this, is that we're, we are to do, to have, to become. We are to do, to have, to become. Okay, but the kingdom view is just to be, just to be, <laughs> just to be his. That's the kingdom view. We will have from being his and we will do from being his. And here Jesus will teach us how to live, listen, from God and not toward God. See, we're trying to perform. We're trying to do enough to get here Sunday to worship. Feel like, yes, I can worship this Sunday because I did this, this, and this. Or I can't because I feel bad that I didn't do this, this, and this, and maybe done this. But I want you to know we worship him for who he is, not for how we've done. And if we learn to live from God instead of toward God, trying to do enough, preach good enough, huh? sing good enough, serve good enough to please him, then we're always going to be in a place where we can't get there and we're gonna live in disappointment. <laughs> See, Jesus ain't done nothing. See, we come in here today and we kind of let the enemy say, well, you, you ain't done enough to worship God. Amen. You ain't done enough to praise God. Amen. You wasn't here Friday night in prayer meeting. Okay, maybe I was somewhere praying. Maybe I wasn't. That don't change my identity. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, my mother's sitting out here. She's 65 years old plus a little tax. And I'm her son regardless. She's kind of stuck with me. God likes to be stuck with us. If we can latch on to the fact of how much he loves us, instead of living this thing out of what have I done to measure up to them, what, what have I done this week, this year, in my life to measure up to them? Listen, that is, that is the world view that I have to do to have to become. But Jesus comes up out of that water and gets the approval of the Father and the yes of the Father in the moment he comes out. <laughs> Can anybody hear what I'm saying this morning? 
And then, lastly, there was a yes over David and a yes over Jesus. And now, there's a yes over us. I want to talk to you just a minute. I want you to go to the book of John. I want to show you a scripture. The yes on us is based on two things, and they're in this order. Really one thing, but I'm going to add two and make sure I say in this order. The yes is based on who you are to him. 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 Not who you are to somebody you live with. Not who you are to somebody that's seen you do something one day. Not who you are to what people think about you and how religious people look at you. Who you are to him. This thing is based, the yes on us is based on who you are to him. (laughs) See, here's my daughter Chloe. She's not going to like this. Sandy's holding on. But she's my daughter. And if you don't like her, she's still my daughter. And if you don't like the way I favor her, she's still my daughter. And if you're jealous of her, envious of her, she's still my daughter. Nothing changes. And if she fails, she's still my daughter. And if she succeeds, she's still my daughter. You see, you gotta understand it's not a, none of this is based from my fatherhood to my daughter on all of this stuff. It is based on the fact that I was there when she was born, nine pounds, one ounces. I said, God, she was born with a cabbage patch doll in her hand. <laughs> huh? Sandy, you all right? <laughs> a few minutes later, they put the stuff on Sandy trying to help her breathe. I'm running from this bed to that bed. <laughs> Huh? She's mine. Listen to me. Listen to me. We got to get this in our spirit because we're living from failure too much. We're living from a day on the calendar too much. When the blood of Jesus cleansed that, she's mine. And that's the way I feel about it. Thousands and millions of people are going to go to church all their life and get buried in the church cemetery and never know, never knew they had a father. They're going to think they had a God that was after them. Never know they had a father, a father, a father. Let me stop and say this in love. Just because your father didn't understand. Maybe he didn't, maybe he lived unhealed. Maybe he lived unhealed. Maybe he never got teaching like we get today. Most of them didn't. Right? Just because he didn't understand don't mean God is like him. Just because that, you know, that Maybe you were mistreated by a father that didn't understand. Always go to the cross. Jesus hung on the cross. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not. They don't understand what they're doing. And in the natural, you would say, yes, they understand, but he's not talking about, did he know he took the hammer and swung and hit the nail? That's not what he's saying. He said, they don't understand that I am the Savior. They don't understand what they were doing and how it's damaging other people. And I tell you this today, that just because your father didn't have it all together and you're living from that wreckage or damage maybe doesn't mean God is like him at all. He'd have been the best father you ever met if he'd have met the father I'm talking to you about. 
this Father will help you to forgive not only him, but everybody. Let me tell you something. Watch this. John 17. We've got to get this yes on you this morning. We're going to give you the first Holy Ghost tattoo you ever had. And I don't even do tattoos and don't teach them, but we're going to give you one boom this morning on your forehead. It's going to be yes. <laughs> now don't nobody go get a tattoo on your forehead and come in here. Uh, sometimes the things I say. John 17, watch this. Jesus said, I in them and thou in me. He's praying. He's talking to the Father that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You see, that yes that God put on Jesus, he loves you the same way. Now, I'm not saying you can just live any way you want. I'm just telling you, the reason most people live the way they want is just because they don't understand who they are. They don't understand whose they are. They don't have a love relationship with God. Okay? And I want you to know, according to the word of God, the lips of Jesus, that he prayed that, and he revealed this truth. God, you love them just like you loved me. Now, I don't know how rich that is to you or heavy it is, but maybe... Maybe you'll be driving down the road and a light will come on. We ain't flipping rose petals, does he love me or love me not? He loves us the same way he loved Jesus. Okay? And he really can't love but one way because he is love. So he looks at us. Listen to this now, just a few more minutes. He looks through eyes God looks at us through the eyes of your future and destiny, not through eyes of your, your past and history. Okay? God's not sitting there looking at you backwards. He's looking at you frontwards. Okay, you got to get a hold of that. You got to know that He loves you. If you're going to walk in that, yes... Those other two did and we can, okay? Ephesians 1, I want to give you a few scriptures right here. Shared this scripture last week. Ephesians 1, verse 4. According, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, to believers, Acts 19, believers that were filled with the Spirit, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Everybody say chosen. chosen. We were chosen in him. We were chosen in him. The natural man can't receive that. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. God don't make a pick, a choice, and not have a plan for it. Verse 5 says, Having predestined us unto the adoption of children, we were chosen and we were adopted. We were chosen and we were adopted. Okay? Like that little boy that went home from school crying. His mama said, What's wrong with you? She, he said, Everybody in the school is picking at me because I'm adopted. And she said, you go back and tell them they did, their mom and daddy didn't have a choice. I had a choice. I chose to adopt you. Right? God chose to adopt us. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath what? Made us accepted in the beloved. He has chosen us. 
He has adopted us. He has accepted us. People that don't have a right view of a father don't understand that and fight with it. But we are chosen, we are loved, we are chosen, we are adopted, we are accepted. Verse 7 says our sins are forgiven. Now let me jump the fence right here on you and tell you what a problem that we have. John 14 and 9, I want to teach this for just a moment. See, here's what we do in the church, and I'm talking about every church, most every church. We've seen a good Jesus, but we've seen a moody, hot-headed, angry God. <laughs> we read the Bible, and we see how good Jesus is. But we've been taught that God has got a gavel that he's waiting to swing on us, to judge us. That God is walking behind you with a ball bat. And if you step out of bounds, he's going to club you. See, when I started going to church, when I went, got in the Pentecostal realm, and got filled with the Holy Ghost and didn't understand any of this, but man, I, I don't want to be critical, but it was like, I'm hearing this stuff preached, and I'm thinking, there's no way that I'm going to make it to the finish line. I'm going to be conked out real quick. I'm holding my pew, right? Because... An angry God was presented. Come on, some of you understand what I mean. A, a, a hot-headed God, Father, was presented. The stories of Jesus was all good. But then when it come to God, it was like, man, you don't want to mess with him. <laughs> and the, the attitude was, the only reason I'm making it it's because Jesus stands between me and a big old man, God. <laughs> but Philip was asking Jesus something one day. And in this scripture, Philip, Jesus told Philip, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen how I love people. You've seen how I treated people. You've seen how I fed people that was hungry. You've seen how I walked you through the cornfields and let you eat even on the Sabbath when everybody was against it. You saw how good I've been. If you saw me, you saw how he acts. Let me give you a few scriptures real quick. Jeremiah 1 and 5. Now, you don't have to turn there because I'm going to be moving too quick because i got to go somewhere and I'm going to close. Jeremiah 1 and 5. The Lord said, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Listen to that. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I had a plan for you. I sanctified you. Let me give you just a few more places. Psalms 139. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that thy soul knoweth right well. The psalmist is talking about the goodness of God. He said how precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of your thoughts. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sea. God said that. God told his people through the lips of Jeremiah in a 70-year captivity. He said, the day is coming when I'm going to bring you out. For I know even when you're in captivity, watch this. I'm thinking about you. 
For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. See, God was thinking positive. God was placing a yes on his children even when they were not where he wanted them to be. That's not promoting sin. That's talking about how good God is. See, we spend too much time talking about our efforts and where they get us. And let me tell you, God's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. If it wasn't for him, none of us could be sitting here this morning enjoying his presence. Listen to these scriptures and listen to me. Listen to what he says about you. See yourself like he sees you. Feel, feel about yourself the way he feels about you. <laughs> Love yourself the way he loves you. <laughs> Hold on a minute, I gotta get that. That, that didn't get across. We were in the, in the hardware store the other day and these guys at the counter brought up said something about the Lord and we began to talk and they kind of went this way and I said, well, we just want to walk in love toward this situation. Yeah, we got love, everybody. I said, well, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And I said, really, we, most of us do that. We do love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't love our neighbor too good because we don't love ourselves too good. And I know that sounds like I, me, religion, but I'm telling you, church, this, if, if God loves us this much, then we ought to love what he loves. The reason we can't love people that's out there is because we don't love ourselves like God loves us. <laughs> I'm gonna say it again. Listen to what he said about you. You done heard everybody's opinion. You done heard about what somebody in your family said. You will never amount to a hill of beans, not worth the salt it goes on bread. Never have anything. You've heard all that negative, the negative cursings. A curse without a cause can't light on us. They can say all they want, but it can't light. You've heard all this stuff about what they said about you. They're basing their assessment on your history and your past. Look to what he says about you. Listen to what he says about you. See yourself like he sees you. Feel about yourself the way he feels about you. Love yourself the way he loves you. I tell you, when we get them things right there in our spirit and start walking in them, God will set our platform like he did this woman. Listen to me. She walked out on that platform. I'm gonna close with one more thing. She walked out on that platform like everybody's always called me a loser. I'm gonna give it another shot. Unbeknowing, unbeknowing what was fixing to happen. Amen. Listen to me. If we live our lives on what other people say about us, watch this, even on what we feel about ourselves because what we feel about ourselves is based on history. Yeah. 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 We're gonna stay right where we are. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. And I'll be careful here, but Lisa, I just wanted to share one thing you said, and I'll be very respectful. But God just touched this precious life Wednesday night. She said something that most people, they live in this mindset. We were praying for her, and she said, listen to this, I didn't think that the Lord 
would take me back. Now every, all of that thought pattern, and I've been there, is based on history. Past. Here, back. Here, back. When, when she said that, immediately the Lord gave me a thought to counter that lie with truth. To bring light to darkness. And here's what the Lord gave me. When the prodigal son was coming home, he was a mess. There wasn't no holiday in between the hog pen and the father's property. There wasn't no showers and rest areas. He stunk. He was a mess. He came as is. When he come home and he started turn and started down that driveway and everything was working against him. You'll never get back home. You'll never get restored. You'll never get back to where you used to be. You'll never have that calling again. You'll never have that gift again. You'll never have that place at the table again. He won't ever take you back. And the Lord spoke to me to tell his precious sister, when the father saw him, he ran toward him. He ran toward him. He ran toward him. He ran toward sin. He ran toward a mess. He ran toward problems. He ran toward bad decisions. That's what kind of father that we're serving, one that will run toward you. He'll run toward you. He'll run toward you. See, what we don't see in that story, and I'm closing, what we don't see is, it's kind of subtle, it's kind of under the radar. But God, the Father, in that story, only gave him a portion. He didn't give him all of it. He knew you ain't mature enough for it all. So he just gave him a portion. Huh? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, he knew, God knew. When he put you in that heavenly place, there was things in you, even though he said yes, he knew there were things in our lives that we were going to have to get out and we hadn't fully been persuaded yet. He knows this stuff. And this father, he just give a little portion he give a little portion. What am I saying? I'm saying, when he come back home, he said, you think you wasted it. I got way more than I give you. I got way more than I give you when you left for what you had because I knew, I knew. Come on, Brother Gary. Listen to me this morning. When we look at this lady on this screen. I've been preaching 31 years next week. I ain't never put nothing like that up on the screen. And I sit there in my office and I said, Lord, are you serious? You see, there's people that feel like that lady. And in you is, it's like wine that's ready to burst out. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you do. <laughs> In you is gifts. It's like when a woman is carrying a baby nine months and two weeks. It's like, now, now, nowadays they pick a date. Back when we were coming up, you didn't pick a date. Water broke and you tore out. <laughs> Some of you, your water has broke. And you, you're saying, I've never had a chance. See, this woman knew in the secret place 
what was going on in her life. She knew I didn't sing good as them. <laughs> she would listen to herself sing and say, wow, some of you have been touched by the Holy Ghost in such a way that you could say, if I could ever have a platform somewhere. And they said, well, why? What, what happened? Watch this. What, what happened? Why, why has it never worked out before? Well, I've never been given a chance. I've never been given a chance. But here, I'm hoping that'll change. See, that's what kind of church I want to be in. I want people that's sitting out there that's about to burst at the seams that knows. Man, if, preacher, if you only knew, I go down the road in my truck just like you. I feel the honey falling on me just like, I know everything you're talking about. And the devil tells you you're ugly. Your sin made you ugly. Your failure made you ugly. You don't fit the ministry bill. You don't fit the kingdom of God bill. Look at you. Look at the mess down through your life. He's looking back. God is looking forward. This morning, I believe there's people in this house just like this woman. Well, I've never had a chance. You got a chance at Mercy Ministries. You got a chance here. You got a chance here. You got a chance here. Here, I'm hoping it'll work out. The only, only way that you can't use what God's give you here is if you choose to stay in isolation. If you choose to stay in isolation, come on, let's stand.